The world is at war. World War II has broken out in Europe as the Axis powers take over Poland and France. But halfway around the world, China has been fighting Japanese aggression alone since 1937. Unable to conquer China, Japan decides to expand the war to the Pacific. On the morning of the 7th of December, 1941, Japanese aircraft launch a surprise attack on the US Pacific fleet in Hawaii. Within two hours, they've sunk five battleships, 188 aircraft, and killed over 2,400 American troops. It is a scene of utter destruction, a defining moment that shocks the United States. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. That day, the United States enters World War II. This is a turning point for China. It's no longer fighting the war alone. My name is Rana Mitter, Oxford professor and a historian of modern China. I've spent years researching and writing about China's World War II, a conflict that raged longer than Europe's and was just as devastating. I'm traveling across China to find the last few remaining survivors. And find out what memories remain from the war. To reveal the true stories of China's struggle to survive against all odds. And how victory helped forge China into what it is today. For many Americans, World War II started at Pearl Harbor in 1941. For the Europeans, it started in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. However, China and Japan had already been at war since 1937. In October 1938, Japan had control over much of northern and central China, including its major cities, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Nanjing, and Wuhan. Their troops were advancing west towards southwestern China. Their aim, to capture Chongqing. One of the fastest growing urban centers in the world, with over 30 million people, Chongqing is also one of China's most populous cities. But the city was almost left in ruins during the Second World War. Perched between mountains, covered in fog, it's a real inland fortress and will be extremely difficult for any enemy to capture by land. It was the perfect choice for the nationalists' wartime capital. And then the people rose and moved. When the government moved here, so did schools, factories, and millions of refugees from the occupied areas. From 1938, the wartime capital became a symbol of China's resistance. Residents and refugees supported the nation's economic and wartime demands by manufacturing bullets, weapons, and textiles. But the hills surrounding the city offered only meager protection against Japan's Imperial Air Force. On May the 3rd and 4th, 1939, air raids killed close to 4,000 people and left 5,411 houses destroyed in the first 48 hours alone. People began moving underground for safety as the city of Chongqing was set alight.
This restaurant is actually one of the bomb shelters that remains in Chongqing to this day. During the war years, this city had more air raid shelters than any other in China, over a thousand of them in fact. The Japanese wanted to bomb the government and its people into submission, and many perished during the attacks. In June 1941, thousands suffocated in a shelter as they fled from a day of relentless Japanese air raids. As a member of the air raid rescue team during the war, 92-year-old Gao Rongbing witnessed the tragedy firsthand and is still haunted by it today. Tell me what you remember about the bombing on the 5th of June, 1941. Tibetan 你们那个衣服该打到 Listening to Mr. Gao's story brought home just how desperate people must have been that terrible night in the air raid shelter. But they had nowhere else to go to protect themselves from that air raid. And it brought to mind that war does affect everybody, but it affects different people in different ways. By 1941, there were only enough shelters built to protect around two-thirds of the population. People piled in for safety even when they were overcrowded. The shelter where thousands suffocated is located in downtown Chongqing at Jiaochangkou. I feel like I'm in the world's gloomiest cathedral, but actually, this is the biggest of the air raid shelters that was built in Chongqing during the war. It's big, two and a half kilometers in length, and it's broad, about four meters at its widest. So on my own, it does feel empty, but I can't imagine what it would have been like with thousands of refugees here, panicked, sweaty. Even now, there's a sort of warm, damp atmosphere that I do find quite disturbing. The bombings on Chongqing would last for more than five years, until the 23rd of August, 1943. Four years longer than the infamous German Blitz on the United Kingdom that lasted for a devastating year in 1941. During the most intense bombing period, between May 1938 and August 1941, the city of Chongqing was subjected to over 218 air raids. These missions killed nearly 12,000 people and wounded thousands more. It was imperative for the Chinese to hold on to the West and for Chongqing, the wartime capital, not to fall. Though much of the city was reduced to debris, the Chinese continued their resistance. 
Japan had occupied most of China's major eastern seaports and railway lines. The country was becoming cut off from the outside world. To maintain an armed resistance, China needed aid and supplies from the outside world. And the best plan seemed to be to build a new road from Yunnan across the border to Burma. But it was a near impossible challenge to build more than a thousand kilometers of road through remote mountains and jungle. And if they didn't succeed, the resistance could grind to a halt and the whole country fall under Japanese rule. I'm in Yunnan province in western China, and I'm discovering what happened here in 1937. Japan had invaded China and occupied the prosperous eastern parts of the country. So a road had to be built between this province and Burma, a thousand kilometers to the west. But who was going to build it? With most eligible men fighting in the army, some unlikely candidates answered the government's plea for help. Laborers, including the elderly, women and children used primitive tools to carve out the road. By the end of 1937, nearly 200,000 local laborers had been drafted. But time was against them. The government needed the road finished in just 12 months. The Chinese did something that seemed impossible. They did it in less than a year. They built a road stretching from Kunming, the capital of Yunnan, to Lashio in Burma. If they'd used machinery, it might have taken three years, but the Chinese used the only asset to hand, people. The road provided a lifeline for China and a link to the outside world, but it was short-lived. In 1942, after the Pacific War broke out, Japan moved swiftly and invaded Southeast Asia, including Burma. They then made their way to Yunnan and occupied key towns along the Burma Road. China's lifeline had been severed. An air transport command plane takes off every six minutes. The only reliable way to keep supplies flowing was by air. But because of the threat of Japanese airstrikes, an unconventional, more dangerous route was devised over the Himalayas, from Assam in India to China. With secret approval from President Franklin D. Roosevelt, a crew of discharged elite American pilots, officially known as the American Volunteer Group, was dispatched to support China's Air Force. They became known as the Flying Tigers, led by General Claire Lee Chenault. Chinese pilots were given the task of navigating the treacherous route. At high altitudes of 17,000 to 20,000 feet, the plane's engines could ice over and stall at any time. These dangerous flights came to be known as flying the hump. 99-year-old Dai Zhijin was one of the Chinese pilots who made that journey over the hump. At the age of 22, Dai responded to a recruitment ad for pilots. More than 70 years on, he still remembers his close shaves with death. From the end of 1941, Chinese pilots were sent to America for training. And Dai Jijin was one of them. After he returned, Dai was roped in to support the Flying Tigers, later reorganized 
as the US 14th Air Force in China. One of their key missions was to destroy important Japanese supply lines. Chota Although the Flying Tigers boosted China's air defense and kept supplies flowing, the country needed more relief than just ammunition. Supplies from across the Burma hump couldn't keep China's armies fed. They couldn't continue the resistance. So to solve the food problem, the nationalist government implemented a policy that would compound an already desperate situation. In 1938, as a last-ditch effort to stall the Japanese from advancing towards the military command base at Wuhan, the nationalist government decided to break the Yellow River dikes. The strategy succeeded. China did manage to trade space for time, but the decision also had disastrous consequences. The course of the Yellow River now flowed southeast instead of northeast, flooding large parts of Henan province and inundating its fertile plains. Other factors, a drought, a grain tax, also added to the impact of the flood. Liu Haiyong is an academic who's been studying the impact of the famine in Henan during the war years. Uh 我看到一一個回憶路上,就是文字德上記載的,他就是吃他的糞便。People went to extreme lengths for food. Those who survived never forgot what happened during the famine. broken out. Starting with China in 1937, Japan has turned Asia and the Pacific into a battlefield. In an attempt to stall the Japanese from advancing towards their military command base, the nationalist government breaks the Yellow River dikes in 1938. But widespread devastation ensues in the following years.
I'm in Kaifeng in Henan province, one of the most fertile regions of China, where grains like wheat feed millions of Chinese every year. But it was a very different scene in 1942. Three million Chinese were starving to death. To find out more and get a first-hand account, I'm meeting a survivor who lived through the famine in 1942. 88 years old now, Wang Yanchun was a teenager in 1942. Conditions were harsh, and his family of 11 were forced to live at the local temple after selling their house. What did your family do for food during the famine? What did you eat? <laughs> You saw some absolutely horrific things during the famine. Could you describe some of them for us? Wang Yanchuan was 14 years old when the famine hit. He was a victim of a chain of circumstances, and suddenly he was eating bark from trees. The war was destroying the very fabric of humanity. The famine showed how desperate the situation was. As Chiang Kai-shek himself observed in his diary in 1943, if the war drags on more than a year, then China might not be able to sustain the situation much longer. On February the 18th, 1943, Madame Chiang Kai-shek went to the United States to rally support for the war against Japan. She addressed the US House of Representatives. China is eager and ready to cooperate with you and other peoples to lay a true and lasting foundation for a sane and progressive world society which would make it impossible for any arrogant or predatory neighbor to plunge future generations into another orgy of blood. She won them over with her charisma and helped pave the way for China's inclusion in talks about the ending of World War II. But the political reality was much less rosy. Even before the talks began, there was deep mistrust between the Allies. In 1943, a conference was called in Cairo to discuss the future of the war against Japan. This was the first conference attended by the leaders of the three principal allied countries with a stake in the Asia-Pacific theaters of war. Roosevelt for the United States, Churchill for the British Empire, and Chiang Kai-shek for China. As Chiang observed in his diary, it was my first appearance on the diplomatic stage. The alliance was fragile, 
because its members had very different objectives. The United States and Britain wanted to focus on the war in the Pacific because the Japanese were threatening the British position in Southeast Asia. The war in Europe, at their back door, was threatening to overwhelm China. But despite their differences, they did reach a resolution. The Allies agreed on a united front to resist Japanese aggression and strip Japan of many territories acquired in the Pacific, China and Korea. And back at home, with the support of the Allies, China could now reclaim a key piece of territory. Chinese survival depended on opening the road between Yunnan and Burma to allow supplies through. The strategy was a two-pronged attack from Ledo in India and southwestern Yunnan into northern Burma. But they couldn't do it alone. They needed the Allies to provide more ground support. And when they didn't get it, they had a difficult decision to make. Because of new priorities in Europe, the Allies provided very little ground support. Despite this, China decided to attack the Japanese bases in western Yunnan and drive them out of key towns along the Burma Road. I'm in Tungchung, in Yunnan, near the border with Burma. And it was here, in 1944, that a crucial battle took place to secure the famous Burma Road, China's lifeline to the outside world. The Japanese conquered Rangoon, the capital of Burma, in March 1942. To hold back the Japanese onslaught in Burma, the British fought back, supported by their Chinese allies. Despite the alliance, they lost Lashio, the start of the Burma Road, a month later. China needed to end the blockade of Burma and build a new supply route connecting them to India. But first, they had to drive the Japanese out of Tungchong. This is one of China's best preserved World War II cemeteries, and it's filled with soldiers who died at the Battle of Tongchong in 1944. They were members of the Chinese Expeditionary Force. Among their number, 10,000 elite troops who were trained by the Americans in Yunnan and in India. Known by their code names of X and Y Force, they would become legends of the Chinese resistance. In May 1944, the battle for Western Yunnan began. The 54th Army, 198th Division, led by General Wei Li Huang, the Chinese Expeditionary Force, advanced towards their first target, Tung Chong. But before they could reach the enemy base, they had to cross the mighty Salween River and the nearly impassable Gaoligong Mountains. If they failed, China's resistance would be in grave danger. World War II has broken out, and China has been at war with Japan for seven years. By 1944, Japan has occupied key Chinese territories, including its lifeline to the outside world, the Burma Road. To reclaim the road, the Chinese government decides to attack Japanese bases in western Yunnan and northern Burma. The Chinese Expeditionary Force begin their attack advancing into Tungchong. Countless nameless soldiers died in the battle to regain the road. Their sacrifices have been documented in the collections of Duan Shengkui. A private collector, he's amassed a huge number of items left from the Yunnan-Burma battle. Could you tell me why you decided to set up this museum in the first place? Uh, 
，让我们以后的人呢，呃，这样来警醒这段历史。滇西战场呢，因为我们知道滇西啊都是那个横大山脉以下的，就是山川河流，所以高山阻碍，交通不便，这是我们最大的一个困难。第二个困难呢，就是当时盟国的支持。其实当时我们虽然签订了协议，在支持中是大大的折扣的。With limited support from the Allies, the Chinese Expeditionary Army was stretched. But that was not the only difficulty they faced. To reach the Japanese, they had to cross the mighty Salween River. But the only route across, the Huitong Bridge, had been bombed by the Chinese Army in 1942. To stop the Japanese from advancing into Yunnan through the Burma Road, U.S. Army blasting machine. Wow, amazing to think it was used at that time. 对，这个太重要了，因为它只是一个引爆剂，啊，引爆炸弹，炸毁会通桥以后，才把日本鬼子阻阻在陆江以西。主要是会通桥啊，是当时整个滇缅公路的咽喉。如果那一个桥没有炸断。那么日军呢就会跨个桥，跨个桥来以后，那么宝山就沦陷，最后呢，大大理沦陷，昆明沦陷，整个中国的抗战可能就要这个这段历史就要重新改写。Duan Shengkui's collections provide a window into China's past, and the artifacts remaining from the war show just how brutal the battle was. Tung Chong was finally won by the Chinese on the 14th of September 1944 in their campaign to regain control of the Burma Road. Another decisive battle was fought at Songshan. It was a major gateway for access to the road. 200,000 soldiers from the Chinese Expeditionary Force advanced into the Songshan mountain area. A bloody three-month battle. Ensued. I'm on my way to meet 87-year-old veteran Li Wende, who fought in the Battle of Songshan at the age of 16. His memories of the war are crystal clear. Li was forcibly recruited to become part of the army while he was out working in the fields. After only a few months of training. He was sent to the front lines in the Battle of Songshan. What do you remember about the beginning of the Battle of Songshan? When the Japanese came, they were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. We were able to defend the Battle of Songshan. It must have been a very dramatic battle. Were there particular incidents that you remember? Songshan Bridge, that was Hongshu Bridge. That bridge was quite deep. It's not in China. It's not in China. We have to drill a lot. 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 跨着跨着林子，林子天林子响，没到处去打机枪啊，枪子你嘎嘎嘎，你嘎嘎嘎，就响了几枪，几枪一直比了啊半个多小时啊。呃，一个人把铁丝剪，剪那个铁丝网，剪子三个人嘛就剪断三个铁丝，这三这三个铁丝在拉我就转去。那拉住铁丝网，那些剪开，这个拉头，变个拉头，拉开呢，剪出钻子来。就从一个马二哥，胡连长和张谦，三个就拉，全头了，孙六丹，孙六丹头了以后就拉，中间就打到军人们，日本
The last year of the war was a terrible time for the Chinese army. There was forced conscription, and there were low supplies of food and of weapons. And yet they still managed to win battles like Songshan. The trenches where Li and others fought still remain. They were an important part of Japanese strategy in the battle. After numerous attempts, the Chinese finally came up with an idea to destroy their forts. The Chinese faced some setbacks as the Japanese trenches and forts were very hard to penetrate. So they had to dig a tunnel through the mountain where the forts were located, 150 meters long. Then they packed the tunnel with explosives and blew up the fort. Chinese military strategy had defeated Japanese morale. Songshan was finally recaptured on the 7th of September, 1944, at the cost of 7,600 Chinese soldiers and some 1,200 Japanese defenders. As a result, the Allies recaptured Western Yunnan and Northern Burma and regained the Burma Road. This also helped clear the way for a new Yunnan-Burma Road, the Ledo Road, which was finally opened in January 1945. Thanks in significant part to the brave actions of the Chinese Expeditionary Force, the Battle of Songshan was an important turning point. 20,000 Chinese soldiers fought at the Battle of Songshan, and 8,000 were killed. These life-size statues commemorate the courage and contribution of these soldiers, which had been forgotten for so long. By the end of 1943, Japan knew the tide was turning against them. Allied assaults had cost them territories in the Pacific, to regain the initiative in the war, Japan would launch an unexpected battle with close to half a million troops. A final showdown that would define a nation. World War II has engulfed most of Europe. By 1944, China has been fighting a Japanese invasion for almost eight years. The Japanese want to destroy US air bases in China, as well as open up land and rail lines to rescue isolated Japanese troops in Southeast Asia. In 1944, they launched Operation Ichigo. It's a huge thrust into central China that the Japanese hope will stretch the Chinese army beyond its limits and bring an end to China's resistance. This might be the final campaign. I'm on my way to Hunan province, where one of the fiercest acts of resistance to Operation Ichigo took place. After the fall of the provincial capital, Changsha, the Japanese moved on to the city of Hengyang. The Japanese were closing in on Hengyang, a major railway junction and gateway to the south. But something was in the way. 18,000 Chinese troops under General Fang Xuanjie were defending a small fortified base against an onslaught of more than 100,000 Japanese troops. 94-year-old Rao Pingru fought in the Battle of Hengyang. Hailing from a family of scholars and academics, Rao was the only one in his family who didn't follow that learned path. The war had started, and he felt he had no choice but to fight. Hello, 
What was your role in that battle, the Battle of Hunyang? Hunyang is the second base of Tao 我就站在后面那个炮子前面跟个这个那个这个五六步嘛很近的可是抢不到啊因为从中往往的那个第三炮是高反就交给去这个第二炮出来那个很紧张嘛往下一丢这个炮呢就在炮炮的里面炸了配
Japan surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. China had huge military disadvantages, yet the Chinese turned what the Japanese military had assumed would be a three-month campaign into a war of attrition lasting until September the 2nd, 1945. The following day is now known as China's Victory Day. The Japanese surrender to China took place at the Central Military Academy in Nanjing. On the 9th of September, 1945, at nine o'clock in the morning, General He Yingqin and Lieutenant General Okamura Yasujiro, representing their respective governments, signed the Act of Surrender. A simple 20-minute ceremony marked the end of eight long years of war. China's World War II was the longest and one of the bloodiest. The war cost China some 14 million or more lives and destroyed the flawed but real modernization that the country had been going through. You can see China's spirit of resistance here at the Liberation Monument in the center of Chongqing, the former wartime capital. The city never fell as the Chinese continued to defend themselves. They also pinned down some 600,000 of the 2.3 million overseas Japanese troops, making China a crucial part of the overall Allied strategy. The council was briefed this morning by... And as a direct result, today China has a seat in the permanent five on the United Nations Security Council, the pinnacle of global diplomacy. But the ghosts of the war with Japan haven't been laid to rest. For the survivors I've met throughout my journey, the horrors of war linger in their memories. But it's obvious that the spirit of resilience and desire for peace has prevailed above all else. China survived World War II and has emerged as a leading world power, but not without the sacrifices of those who fought for freedom against all odds.